next on cybercrime. You can't say certain things about people that are not true. This college professor says a website called teacherreview.com defames him, so he's suing the webmaster. It's a legal landmark focused on free speech. Plus, two men plan a high-tech heist worth millions. So how did investigators prevent this major inside job? Hi, and welcome to another episode of Cybercrime. And this week's show will bring you all the cybercrime news. Now, that includes hacking NASA, an investigation into industrial espionage, and the latest on Napster. But first, let's start out with our top feature. Jennifer? All right, thanks, Alex. Here's a twist on higher education, students grading their professors. One controversial website called TeacherReview.com lets students do just that, but not everyone thinks it's such a good idea. In fact, the site is now at the center of a legal battle. On one side is the webmaster, the other side a professor claiming defamation, and in the middle, the Communications Decency Act. Cybercrime first aired this story in March, and it's still destined to become a legal landmark. It's a cybercrime. It's a cyber evil, any, whatever it is. It should not be allowed. English professor Daniel Curzon Brown is talking about this, a website called teacherreview.com. At the site, students can post reviews and grades, if you will, of teachers. Teachers are given a GPA or grade point average. They're also put into a category, top 15 and bottom 10. The site may sound harmless enough, but not if you ask Curzon Brown. He's soon the webmaster of TeacherReview.com, a lawsuit that challenges free speech on the Internet. There are crimes being committed on Teacher Review. There are wrong things being done to people, people being hurt, cruel, nasty, vicious things that you couldn't ever say to someone in person. You could say this free speech, but you couldn't say this in person. You could not write this. You couldn't leave a note. You couldn't call the teacher's answering machine. You couldn't print it. The alleged crimes Curzon Brown refers to are the reviews he's received on the website. Most are unfavorable. Some are downright vulgar. In fact, according to Teacher Review, the professor's GPA is 1.35, and he's earmarked in the bottom 10. There's a review about me that says, uh, what's he going to do, pick up boys on Polk Street? Implying that I pick up male hustlers on Polk Street. This is still on the site. Well, that's wrong. I don't pick up male hustlers on Polk Street. And, and for anyone to imply that I do is defaming me. But that wasn't the intention of the site, says its creator, Ryan Lathowers. The former City College student explained he started the site to help students choose their professors and classes. I created the site so that students could leave their opinions about other about an instructor's classroom performance on it and how it works is students go to the website, they uh, find a teacher they want to evaluate, they grade the teacher, and then they write their personal opinion about that teacher's classroom performance. And then other students can come and read what other students have written. The key here is personal opinion. That's what the reviews are, according to Bernard Burke, one of last hour's attorneys. Burke has taken on the case along with the American Civil Liberties Union. To the extent that what we're talking about are students expressing their opinions, their, as the questions of evaluation and taste and preference, they're absolutely protected by the First Amendment. Um, and one of the very important principles that this case is about is students' rights to express their opinions in whatever language they see fit about the teachers that they're having in their classes. Think of it like this. If you build a wall, you're not responsible for other people's graffiti. Does the same argument hold true in cyberspace? In other words, if you're a webmaster, are you responsible for what other people post on your site? Bottom line, you can't be held responsible for what other people post on your website. You can be held responsible for what you do yourself, but you can't be held responsible for what other people put up there. That according to the Communications Decency Act, passed by Congress in 1996, the CDA makes a distinction between old media and new. While the publisher of a newspaper or magazine can be held responsible for what others write in the publication, 
The publisher or webmaster of a website can't. Ryan built the wall. Other people came along and sprayed their messages on. And now Professor Chris M. Brown is trying to Ryan responsible for that. Um, he certainly did build the wall and he invited people to come, but that's exactly what Congress wanted people to do. Congress wanted walls built all over the net, all over the, all over the nation. Curzon Brown doesn't see it that way. He claims last hours did more than just build the wall. He's not just a passive provider like America Online. He's actually pointing to certain teachers and saying, don't take these teachers. What does the grade point average? And what's the, what the horrible part of it is, those grade point averages are based on reviews by people who were never their students or by the same angry student sending in multiple reviews. So your grade point average is a lie to begin with, and yet the webmaster is saying, use this to choose your classes. I don't know what to say. <laughs> How can anyone defend this? There are two, two reasons why it's a very easy case. First of all, because the kinds of statements that the professor is complaining about are ones that it's been clear for at least 30 years are fully protected by the First Amendment. And second of all, because since this is a case about speech on the Internet, there's, a, there's legislation that was passed in 1996 that, again, it's very clear that the webmaster isn't responsible for uh, the, the, the postings of third parties. Great story. And the, this story originally did in March, and the complaints existed for a while, but there are some new developments, right? There are. Second professor has joined the lawsuit with Professor Curzon Brown. He, too, is claiming defamation. Mm -hmm. And they've also, the two of them together, have filed a new complaint. And one of the arguments, the claims that they're right. making in this new complaint is that Ryan, the webmaster, is going to the site and taking down positive reviews of these teachers, which is having the effect of bringing down yeah. their GPA. Ryan's lawyer says this is absolutely not true and they're refuting That's that, that claim. That, that Ryan is taking these aggressive steps to pull down the good ones. I don't know. I just, I guess it's my human nature not to think that's going to happen. And also, I assume that those uh, those grades are not good that the new teachers no, are going I mean, right. And clearly we saw from the piece that the reviews that Curzon Brown has received have been uh, have been, we're really bad. And, that, to go and the question and say, is whether they're defamatory. Right, and that's what they're arguing. The professors say they are. Uh, the interesting point will be the way the courts interpret the CA because that's the CDA right. says, Liability. It, says it pretty clear that uh, you cannot yes. hold the webmaster responsible. My feeling on this is that some of the reviews may be defamatory, but the professors are suing the wrong person. Yeah, no, Ryan did I, not post any of these reviews. He's just providing, like we said in the piece, the, the right. wall. No, I agree with you to some extent. But the more Ryan does, the more steps that he takes, and well, we'll see how the courts interpret this. But I would say that the more steps that he takes, the more likely he's going to be responsible. But uh, we'll continue to cover this story. It is a great story. There will be story. more updates. And we'll have more updates. Yes, Thank you, you very much, You're Jennifer. Uh, the defense is currently working on a response to the professor's new complaint. But in the meantime, we'd like to know your opinion about TeacherReview.com. You definitely have an opinion. Perhaps you like the premise of this site, but you think it should be monitored more closely that day. If you think the site should continue as is, six feet, or perhaps you think the entire site should be taken offline, that's a strong news. And that is C. Log on to the website. That's cybercom.com. Tell us what you think. And after you vote, be sure to check out the security scanner. Just click on the icon in the top right hand corner of the page. The virus check will scan your computer for the top five viruses of C. Love bugs and killer resumes. And the security scanner, among other things, will search your computer to make sure that you have the most up to date antivirus program. Now, we are always trying to improve this scanner, so try it and then send us feedback. It's an easy, easy place to send it. Scanner feedback at ZDTV.com. Still ahead on cybercrime. Interpol is looking for a new way to catch cyber criminals. That story is next. In the news this week, a first for Interpol. The International Police Force that combats cyber criminals says it's considering partnering with a private company. Atomic Tangerine in Menlo Park, California, is in talks with the agency to gain access to its vast database of Internet crimes. The partnership is meant to be a major step forward in tackling cybercrime. If you think about it, the power grids around the world are all handled by computers. The um, refineries, any refinery around the world runs on computers. All you have to do is get somebody that has access to that system and they can hold you at ransom. They can shut down the power grids. They can blow up a refinery. 
The partnership was first discussed at an Internet Defense Summit last May. Under the deal, Interpol would open its files to Atomic Tangerine, and in exchange, Atomic Tangerine would grant Interpol access to its vast amounts of public data, like information from private companies about hack attacks. But it's not a done deal yet. Interpol is still exploring the legal implications of opening their databases to a private company. The two groups hope to announce an official partnership in mid-October. Well, one of the web's biggest porn moguls is the target of a federal fraud probe. Seth Warshawski and his Seattle-based Internet Entertainment Group are being investigated for possible credit card fraud and income tax evasion. Last year, Warshawski settled another suit involving credit cards. Their plaintiffs accused him of raising cash by double and triple charging subscriber credit cards using his porn service. On Monday, Napster filed its legal response to the recording industry's attempt to shut it down. The company says its song-swapping software is protected by a federal law, which makes it legal for, to copy music for personal use. The recording industry filed its suit last December, saying Napster encourages large-scale copyright infringement. Napster says the RIAA's request for a preliminary injunction would violate its First Amendment right to free speech. Meantime, NASA is busy denying reports that computer hacker jeopardized the safety of a space shuttle crew. A report from the BBC says during a mission to the Russian space station Mir in 1997, an unidentified hacker interfered with communications. As a result, the space shuttle crew had to use the Russian station to maintain contact with NASA. The space agency says that's not what happened, that in fact the hacker only delayed transmission of medical data between NASA computer systems on the ground. Well, a Japanese attempt to acquire a U.S. Internet service provider is raising eyebrows at the FBI. Vario Incorporated of Colorado says it provides web access for 21% of companies listed in the Standard & Poor 500 Index. The U.S. ISP agreed to a $5.5 billion buyout offer from Tokyo's giant NTT Corporation. But the FBI says foreign ownership of a domestic ISP raises national security questions. And finally, France launches an official investigation into the Echelon Surveillance Network. Using satellite and ground systems, Echelon is said to monitor billions of phone calls, faxes, and emails. There's some concern that the U.S. and Britain may be using Echelon for industrial espionage. Stay tuned. There's more ahead on Cybercrime. It was a brilliant scheme and horrible execution. Two men see an opportunity to steal millions from their employer. How investigators caught on to their high-tech scheme. That story is next. But first, try our timeline. What year did the following events take place? Cliff Stoll's The Cuckoo's Egg is published. The Berlin Wall is open to the West. And the Tel Horvath is named Soviet President. Was the year 1988, 1989, or 1990? <laughs> So, how did you do on the timeline? Cliff Stoll's best-selling book, The Cuckoo's Egg, is published. Mikhail Gorbachev is named Soviet president. And the Berlin Wall is open to the West. The year was 1989. All right, let's skip ahead to 1996. That's when fellow employees Scott Kuznansky and Jonathan May decided it was time to retire and began devising a high-tech scheme to clean out their employer. Inside jobs are a growing concern, according to the Computer Security Institute. Their newest study revealed that in the last year, 71%, 71% of the companies and government agencies surveyed detected unauthorized access by insiders. Here's the story we first brought you last March. Scott Posnansky was one of IA's valued computer programmers, and he was uh, given complete access to IA's computers. Scott Posnansky was also in charge of upgrading insurance auto auctions computer systems, the company in the business of selling wrecked and damaged cars. When a car gets sold, the computer system actually signs and creates and prints a valid negotiable check. During the upgrade, he met fellow employee Jonathan May. Neither men had ever committed a crime, but the two saw a chance to pull off a high-tech heist worth millions. Make computer files for imaginary cars, trick it into believing the cars were sold, then cash the checks. 417 checks, each one varying between $25 and $45,000. 
Jonathan May manipulated computer information to generate over $16 million of checks under phony companies for ghost cars that never existed. And Mr. Posnanski wrote a program, a computer program, that was specifically designed to do only uh, the, to, re to remove and destroy all the, uh, the trace of the crime. Now it was time for Jonathan May to make a big deposit. He targeted Nations Bank, now a part of Bank of America. It was the same bank used by IAA. But which branch? They felt that Maryland, specifically South Baltimore, would be the easiest. They would not require a picture ID, only incorporation documents. They made the incorporation documents from computer uh, software available to them. The fake corporate documents worked, but the bank did require a picture ID. So May called Posnanski from his quality in motel in Baltimore and got the needed tech support. And Scott Posnanski, with his laptop computer, flew from Illinois to Maryland with Jonathan May and met with Jonathan May uh, with the intent of trying to use their computers and jump onto the Internet and create a false identification card for John May. They were unable to do so. But eventually, they were able to do so, and John May, calling himself Jack Murphy, began depositing checks. This is one of three night deposit boxes Jonathan May, a.k.a. Jack Murphy, used to deposit 209 checks. But when he deposited more than $8 million in a 24-hour period, well, it doesn't exactly go unnoticed. They got pretty close. So they got real close. It's kind of ironic that, you know, that really a minimum wage teller of all the technology of everything that was used, it was a minimum wage uh, teller that really picked off the fraudulent scheme. Postal inspectors poured over thousands of bank surveillance pictures. One shot confirming it was John May who opened the account. Another shot confirming May deposited the checks. May was arrested, and this note recovered by inspectors confirmed the rest of the plan to launder money by setting up the phony company Samson Securities in Estonia. Again, technology was crucial to the plan. They went to an online service to create the company. And the whole purpose behind the website uh, was to offer people, ostensibly who want to hide their assets, uh, the ability to take their money, place it outside uh, of the reach of U.S. law enforcement or U.S. creditors, and to do that in such a way that it's, that it's anonymous, that nobody can trace it. The plan was then to ultimately use the computer software uh, provided by the, uh, the Internet company, um, use that software to then move the, comp move the money from the Estonian bank over to a bank account uh, in Switzerland. But instead, in exchange for less jail time, May ratted Poznanski out. I am satisfied with the ultimate resolution. I, I'm most satisfied with the fact that the uh, postal inspector, the investigators in this case, were able to stop the fraud from actually being consummated, from actually being successful. That's the most important thing. It was a brilliant scheme and a horrible execution. Uh, and what they did was uh, very popular. Any corporation in America could probably be defrauded of what they did. But their execution and how they went about doing it, um, if they got, after they got the check, was, was just not intelligent. As I mentioned in the piece, neither man had a prior criminal record. Jonathan May was sentenced to 37 months, but it was reduced to two years once he cooperated with authorities. And Scott Wisniewski, well, he's presently finishing up his 41-month sentence. Still ahead on cybercrime. Still not worried about the security of your computer because you don't store any data on it that you care about? A look back at our very first chaos theory. Sergistic from the hacker group The Cult of the Dead Cow predicts the denial of service attacks before they happen. That's next. Welcome back. Our C3 panel is growing every day, and we want to thank you for helping us create such a diverse expert panel. This week, Abe wants to know, why can't my ISP screen email viruses before sending them to me? Well, Abe, Richard Smith is your man. He's a world-famous security guru and Internet sleuth. Abe, here's Richard Smith with your answer. Abe, your question is right on target. The number one way that computer viruses spread today is through email attachments. And the best place to stop these viruses was right at the mail servers. 
So if AT&T right. isn't scanning for viruses today, be the squeaky wheel and get them to buy some good antivirus software for their mail servers. Thanks, Richard, and thank you, Abe, for your question. And when you have a chance, take a look at our C3 channel. The C3 link is located on the left-hand nav bar of our website. The address, cybercrimes.com. It's time again for Chaos Theory. We finished this show where we began with our very first Chaos Theory. Statistic from the hacker group, the Cult of the Dead Cow, warned the public how easy an attack could be launched remotely from a range of computers. Interestingly enough, the same day we recorded that theory, the world experienced a major distributed denial of service attack. There was no connection, but clearly the Chaos Theory was right on. Still not worried about the security of your computer because you don't store any data on it that you care about or you just use it for games? Well, if your computer has even one piece of software running on it that's misconfigured, it could be used to attack other machines on the Internet and they'll trace back to you. Not only that, but huge lists of people with these problems on their computers are being traded. For what reasons? Who knows? Perhaps somebody's collecting huge groups of computers to use in a massive parallel attack against somebody. After I released Back Orifice to the world, you could scan pretty much any group of dial-up machines in the world, and you would find several machines that had Back Orifice on it. This means that those machines could be completely controlled by anybody who knew they were there. Once the locations of those machines start getting added to lists, those are traded on the Internet, and people end up with thousands and thousands of machines that they can control for their own purposes. How do you defend yourself against this? The best thing you can do is to know your computer as well as you can, and know when it's time to pull the plug out of the wall. Jennifer, I know that they have production equipment and, they have, and a digital camera, so we should expect a lot more coming from the culture Good. of the dead cat. Yeah, I definitely look forward to it. Well, that does it for another show for another week. If you have feedback or story ideas, drop us an email at cybercrime.gdtv.com and chat with us. Do that on Monday between 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And at our website, of course, you'll find more information on the stories we've covered and the latest in cybercrime news. That's it for now. We'll see you next time. We will see you next time.